yes, I do consider myself a libertarian. I heard about these ideas when I was about 17, and I like the label because it's a broad label. It's a label where it includes a lot of different viewpoints, and so it's one where it's easy to stay libertarian because it doesn't mean any exact narrow thing. As a libertarian, my, my you know, view is you know, government is best, which governs least. And I think that you know, the things that government does mostly can be divided into two categories, bad things and things government does badly. Right? So there's bad things that just shouldn't be done at all. Like I think that people should not be put in jail for using drugs or for selling drugs. People should not be put in jail for trying to move to a different country and get a job. And then there's things that government does badly. You know, things like you know, running the schools, where government spends an enormous amount of money but gets very little learning. Or things like, you know, of course, uh, you know, like you know, regulation of housing, where a you know, business wants to make a lot of houses and government says, you need to fill out 100 forms first and then we'll think about it. So uh, that's, that's a way, way I would think about it. So. so one, you know, by subsidizing at the higher levels, are we devaluing it? Maybe. <laughs> uh, so you, know, like you might say, well, when you give it more money, you make it feel more valuable. You know, you know, like, I, mean, I would say that it depends on whether you're giving the money in a very meritocratic way where the money is for the very best or whether you're just giving the money to, any, to anyone. In practice, I'd say that governments usually spread the money around and so it does devalue it. Uh, you know, so like, is a government role in education justified? Uh, what I say in the book is no. Right, and in particular, I say that education is just greatly overrated. The many wonderful things that people say education does, when you really look at the numbers, it doesn't do what people are hoping for. And so I say this is something very wasteful. Uh, so you know, like in an analogy I like, in the United States, it's common for government to subsidize stadiums for sports, right? And why? Well. You know, people just want to have more of these great stadiums. There are stories about how important it is to have sports stadiums, but they're really not very good. And I think of subsidies to education is very much like that. It's something that sounds really good, it's popular, but actually it's really very wasteful. I mean, the question like, you know, how is it that voters you know, decide how to vote? What I say in the book is it's almost all emotional. And even when people are talking about how the world works, wishful thinking plays a large role where like, like whoever you like is making things better in the world, whatever you don't like is making things worse in the world. So yeah, of course, uh, you know, a lot of people have much resentment against business and markets. And so I think people tend to blame business and markets for problems even when business is really doing a great job. And on the other hand, they tend to think of government as being a solution and uh, to, you know, to you know, even if they're never quite happy, still they think of government as the savior, right? And, and I say that's generally not actually justified, right? But you know, you know, like, I mean, so much of this is emotional, where like, like you know, people just have resentment against people who are rich, the resentment against business, and then, well, who's to blame? Well, of course, it's whatever I resent that's to blame. Uh, now, as to what can we actually be done about this? Well, uh, it's hard. Right, because I think this actually comes from deep within human nature. It's not just that people have been told the wrong things. I think that people are told the wrong things because the wrong things are very emotionally appealing. Uh, so what can you do when the truth is not emotionally appealing? Well, there's repetition, 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 repetition. Right, so I'm a big fan of that. So that's something that works. You have to just keep telling people the same thing. Um, you know, there's just trying to say things in a more entertaining way, right? So, you know, like I am an economics professor, I am I'm in the media. A lot of what I try to do is figure out, well, how can I say what's correct in a way that is not boring? You know, like people usually are just very bored hearing about things like this. So that's something else that I try to do. I mean, I, I guess, you know, like, like honestly, just remember, like you're just one person. And so it takes a whole lot of people working for a very long time to get any change in public opinion. So, you know, it's not a reason not to try, but it's a reason to realize, you know, there isn't any easy solution. It's one where you like, you know, like more hard work, you know, trying to harder to figure out ways to communicate more effectively. 
right? You know, so you know, social media is of course a great opportunity to communicate in a new way, but you know, oftentimes, you know, probably most of the time, people use it very poorly. So I mean, like I, I always try to, you know, to treat people fairly and listen to what they have to say and to talk to people in a friendly way. That's my style. That I think that works well for me. Although, you know, like honestly, I've seen people who do well just being a big jerk, <laughs> getting <laughs> attention for that. I mean, I, you know, my, my, at least my feeling is that in the long run, that doesn't work well, but I'm not really convinced. Uh, I mean, a lot of it is I just don't want to talk to people that way. Right. So the idea of open borders is that everyone on earth should be free to live and work where they want, unless, of course, they belong in jail. Right. And uh, you know, this is something you can see in EU policy, where if you're a member of the EU, you're allowed to live and work in any country in the EU. And I think this has been a fantastic success. It's a great way of moving human talent to where it can accomplish the most. And it's also a vital part of human freedom. And I say it'd be better if we saw this not just in some parts of the world or between two countries or a group of countries, but if we could have it everywhere. Um, now, you know, as, as to why. So, so you know, like usually when people talk about immigration, they think about immigration as charity. So like, let's be nice, let's in, let in some Venezuelans, they're suffering, it'll be a burden on us, but let's be nice people, right? I say this is exactly the wrong way to think about immigration. I say, you know, think about immigration as being about prosperity and about basic justice. So, you know, you know, prosperity because when you move people from countries where their productivity is low to countries where their productivity is high, it doesn't just enrich the immigrant, it enriches the world. Right? So when you move someone from Venezuela where due to their horrible political system, people produce very little, you move them to Spain where productivity is much higher. It, of course, it's better for the Venezuelans, but it's better for the world because as long as they're in Venezuela, their talent is almost totally wasted. And so... You know, to me, really, this is like moving any, you know, any good from places where it isn't very useful to places where it is useful, right? So that's why when people say like, well, like how much can we afford to do? Like, we can afford to do all the people want because it's not something that makes us poor. It's something that makes us rich, right? And then I, you know, I also think about it as justice rather than charity. I say you know, like just allowing a person to get a job is not charity. This is basic human decency. And you know, the way that we should think about it is in this way, right? So I understand that in Spain, when an immigrant arrives, they can get all the government benefits, but they have to wait three years to work, right? And to me, this is exactly the opposite of a sensible system. Sensible system is where you can work the day you show up. We like people to work. Working is good. Working is how the way that human beings contribute to society. And on the other hand, it's the government benefits that I say that people should be, should be worried about and should be saying, well, is, you know, is that something that we can afford to do? Is that something that's wise? Right? But so, you know, that's, you know, you know, like, you know, such a strange way that people think about the world of like working is something you want to stop. And I said, you know, working is something that's good. And when someone wants to move from one place to another for a better job, if they're crossing national borders, this is something that is for the betterment of not only the immigrant, but mankind. I'd say that you know there is no minimum size that can guarantee that. So you know, like as long as long as you've got democracy, then you know even at a very local level, a politician to win has to be popular. So even if it's very small, you can have very bad policies at the, at the local level. Um, my favorite example in the United States is public education. You know, school. So schools in the United States are very decentralized, and yet they have. At very high levels of funding and very poor learning outcomes. So I'd say that you know, like, like just decentralizing is not enough to give you a good result. Uh, so, you know, that's you know, I, I wish it, I wish that it were right. But you know, I mean, I think decentralizing does help. But main thing to remember is that competition between for-profit firms is very different from competition between non-profit firms. If you have non, you know, so governments are non-profits. So if you have many small nonprofits competing, you still should not be confident the result will be good. You know, this is, this is a lot like having a lot of students take a test, but there's no credit. You don't get a grade for it. The students don't work hard, right? So for-profit competition is good, not just because it's decentralized, but because the competitors have a strong incentive to do well and to win. And nonprofit competition just isn't like that, unfortunately.
I mean, I don't think the technology that we're seeing requires any big change in government policy. I mean, you could say that we need to deregulate so that the new technologies can be used. I mean, the interesting thing is that often new technologies are not very regulated because they're new. So no one has bothered to pass laws to prevent them from working. Right? So like, that was the whole Uber strategy was, look, there's no laws about us. So what we're doing is legal. We can do what we want. Right. Uh, so I would say that, you know, in, you know, at least in some ways, new technologies actually have a, you know, a better legal climate than old technologies because government has not started to interfere with them you know, at least as much. Um, in terms of like how government needs to change, you know, for the new technologies, say, you know, like, you know, government should get out of the way because, you know, there's so many technologies that would be you know, that have so much potential and yet government doesn't want to allow them or government hinders them. Um, in terms of you know, what government could do to help new technologies, uh, so I mean, I, you know, like you know, driverless cars are the one that I think is you know, most likely to be really revolutionary and just to change the way that the people actually real, you know, live their lives in a very deep way. So you know, you know, things like deregulating construction in more remote areas so that people can you know, build housing and live further away. Uh, so there's that. Um, you know, of course, you know, just very basic things like not banning driverless cars when there's the first fatal accident, right? You know, which will be a temptation as soon as one driverless car kills one person. Well, it's a bad technology, it has to be banned. And you know, what about the thousands of people killed every year by regular cars? Well, but that's not the fault of the technology, that's the fault of people. It's like, well, it's all together, really. It's all part of a package. So, so, but anyway, like, I mean, my honest view is people often ask me, how is technology changing the world? And my answer is much more slowly than I'd like. Because according to the data we have, technology was changing more rapidly between 1930 and 1970 than between 1970 and today. What we have now is a few areas where there's very rapid and dramatic change, and then many areas where change is fairly slow, right? And so when people get worried, oh my God, how are we going to handle this world of, of super fast technological growth? I say, I wish we had that problem. I'd like to be in the world of super fast technological growth. Right now, what we have is a lot of hopes, but you know, the actual change is you know, still there. It's still good, but it's nothing out of science fiction. Instead, what we have is you know, very slowly moving along. Hopefully in 10 years, we'll have the driverless cars. Come on, you know, please make it happen. But uh, you know, still, you know, you're not as fast as, um, as you know, any reasonable person would hope. Right? You know, of course, like, you know, the really revolutionary technology would be if we could get human life expectancy to start rising rapidly. But you know, like for the last 30 years, it has not risen rapidly in rich countries. You know, poor countries are using technologies that rich countries had long ago to catch up. But in rich countries, life expectancy has not been rising quickly. Right? And you know, how can we change laws to deal in a world where people live to 200 years old? God, I hope we can talk about that realistically because I don't want to live, I don't want to die at 80. Uh, 200 sounds pretty good to me. Sounds great. You know, 200, yeah. Usually, especially as I've, as I've gotten older, I've wanted to focus on issues where I think that I can persuade re very, you know, reasonable people that are moderate. Right, so that's you know what a lot of what I did in the myth of the rational voter. I wanted to talk to moderate people about the problems of democracy, and that's what I've done in my education book. That's what I'm doing in my immigration book. Is you know I want to find you know, to talk to people that don't agree with me, you know, like that are nor that are you know there's a lot of people that uh, that think like they do, and yet you know they're reasonable and wanting to have a conversation. Um, my views on anarchism. I guess I've done some blog posts on anarchism, so. I mean, probably the most original thing that I've done on anarchism in the last 10 years, I have a blog post called Crazy Equilibria, where it begins by talking about democracy in Sweden. And in this piece, I say, right, imagine it's the year 1000 AD, you're in Sweden, and you say, instead of having monarchy, why don't we go and have a system where we all go and write the name of the person we like on a piece of bark, and put it in there, and whoever gets the most signs of bark gets to be the new leader. And I said, at that time, all of the Vikings would have just laughed 
laugh. That's ridiculous. They said, well, what would stop the current king from just murdering whoever won this election? That's the stupidest idea I ever heard. All right. And yet now, if you were to go to the Swedish government and the, and the ruling party there saying, well, we could lose this election. If someone said, well, why don't we just murder the, our opponents? Now people would laugh at that, right? Which means that it's not actually something fundamental to the system of monarchy or democracy that a policy, that a big change in the system of government is, is funny. It, it heavily depends upon what other people think is ridiculous. When everyone believes in monarchy, saying that we shouldn't have monarchy sounds like a joke. And when everyone believes in democracy, then saying that you should just go and murder your opponents is a joke. Right? So when I say this means that we have what economists call or social scientists call multiple equilibria, where whatever people, you know, at least to a large degree, whatever people think is workable is likely to exist. Just like if people expect Spanish to be spoken in a country, Spanish will be spoken. If people expect English to be spoken, English will be spoken. Now, what does this have to do with anarchy? I say anarchy is a system which, like monarchy, like democracy, you know, is stable if people expect it and take it for granted, right? And you know, there's been you know, when researchers uh, you know, who have talked about anarchism have said, "Well, we'll have a system of private police, private courts." It sounds very silly to people today, and I say, you know, it, in a sense, it is silly because if you try doing it today, when no one thinks it's a good idea, or almost no one thinks it's a good idea, it would just collapse. But I say that anarcho-capitalism you know, is a lot like. You know, democracy, you know, so, you know, today sounds a lot like democracy would have sounded to Vikings you know, a thousand years ago. Namely, it's something where if you really listen, you realize that the problem is not that the system is bad. The problem is that the system is unfamiliar. Right. Now, uh, you could say, well, yeah, well, how do we get this unfamiliar system to be familiar? So that's really hard. All I can say is this happened before, right? We really did move from Viking monarchy to Swedish democracy. Right? So it's, uh, it's something where it is hard to go and change people's expectations and to make the unfamiliar familiar. But I see the main problem with having a system like anarcho-capitalism is not that it is not, that it is intrinsically not a workable system. The problem is just that it's a system that sounds so strange to people that it's hard to get them to listen. But I say, look, you know, the first step is to say, well, look, you know, if, if, if we're expected, then how it would work? And this is where arguments about how, what's well, a system where people have to have their own police company, when police have a dispute, there's a court system, uh, you know, uh, firms work out a system of rules in advance in order to handle the problem, much like insurance companies do today. You know, like, you know, these arguments, like, you know, they sound like science fiction in the same, but I say it's science fiction, not like fast and light travel, something that actually is impossible. Rather, it's science fiction in the sense that democracy would have been science fiction to Vikings a thousand years ago. When I was 17, uh, my longest, my oldest friend in the world, uh, Matt Mayers, gave me a copy of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. And I read that and I, it took me three days to read it. I was barely sleeping. Oh my God, what's going to happen next? And after I read it, it was so different from anything that my teachers had told me, so different from anything that I'd heard, that I was curious to start reading economics and say, well, like, is what she's saying even possible or would it just be the disaster that my teachers and parents have always told me that it would be? And that's why I started studying economics, right? And then, you know, at first I read, you know, Austrian economics, you know, non-mainstream economics. But from there, I went and started reading, you know, much more, you know, like mainstream economics, regular economics textbooks. And then, you know, then, ev then eventually, you know, I spent, I spent a lot of time, you know, straddling two worlds, straddling this weird libertarian world and the world of mainstream economics, mainstream philosophy. I mean, I went to very normal schools. I went to UC Berkeley, which you know, has a you know, very, no very normal American economics department, very normal philosophy department. I got my PhD for, uh, in economics from Princeton. Again, that's you know, about as normal as you can get, about as mainstream as establishment. And so, you know, I, I spent you know, you know, many years studying you know, like, like normal elite views, but also always kept contact with these heterodox views that, uh, that I had been interested in when I was young. And, and then actually I'd say, you know, like for me, like, you know, the biggest intellectual development since then is I just became very interested in psychology. And so, you know, of course, you know, Kahneman Tversky, but, 
you know, many other psychologists that are less famous. So, you know, Philip Tetlock is, has been an enormous influence on me. Uh, so, you know, like, you know, he has his book, Super Forecasting. So that's been a big influence. Uh, my colleague, Robin Hansen, who's just so interested in, you know, betting markets and prediction markets. Uh, you know, he was a very large influence on me as well. Uh, but, you know, like, I mean, uh, but I mean, I'd say, the, you know, like for me, like probably just the general interest in psychology has been the biggest. And you can see that in the myth of rational voter, uh, where I spend a lot of time studying well, what does the people actually believe about economics. Never mind what what is the right economic theory. What do people think, and what do politicians respond to? Are they going to respond to what's true? No, they're going to respond to what's popular, of course. And in my book, Selfish Reason to Have More Kids, uh, there I put a lot, uh, spent a lot, a lot of time on. How it is, you know, first of all, how, you know, how is it that we inherit psychological traits, right? How is it that, uh, the, you know, that human beings acquire, you know, their intelligence or their personality or their views on religion or whatever, and, but also trying to understand the psychology of family decisions. Why is it that so many people are afraid of having children in the modern world? I talk about that. Of course, the case against education is also very heavily about human psychology, because economists usually focus on the financial effects of education, which I say are important, but we should also focus on the cognitive effects of education. What does education actually teach you? What skills do you acquire in school? Right? So you know, there's, not, you know, there's fields like industrial psychology where they try to examine how do people acquire job skills? What, you know, like where do job skills come from? And that was a big element of the case against education. And then you know, finally, uh, you know, like you know, my, you know, my forthcoming book, uh, Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration, that one, you know, in a way, the whole book is, is applied psychology because I'm trying to explain arguments that most people would find both uh, either offensive or boring or both and figure out a way to sell the ideas in a way that keeps people reading and prevents people from saying, I won't listen. So I learned Austrian economics before I learned any regular, uh, learned regular economics. So you know, like when I like after reading Atlas Shrugged, then there's a there's a reading list in Ayn Rand's Capitalism: The Unknown Ideal, where she lists her approved economists. So Ludwig von Mises, and then from Mises found you know Murray Rothbard especially, but you know, also you know, Hayek, and then read like you know, Menger, Mabavark, and uh, you know like many, and then you know, like whoever was getting you know people getting published in you know, the Review of Austrian Economics, Journal of Libertarian Studies. So this is what I learned first. I actually, I met Murray Rothbard twice, once uh, before I started college in uh, the Mises Institute in 1989, and then I got to meet him one other time, uh, like I think it was in 1990, a year later. So I mean, I met almost all of the leading living Austrian economists in the world in 1989 at that conference. So you know, I met you know, you know, Joseph Salerno and Roger Garrison and Walter Block and Hans Hermann Hoppe and uh, many other people uh, there. So anyway, so I learned Austrian economics before I learned regular economics. I was initially like a very enthusiastic fan. And when I started studying regular economics at UC Berkeley, you know, mainstream textbook economics, I put a lot of energy into arguing with them and saying, you know, Austrian economics is right, mainstream economics is wrong. And over the years, what I decided is, well, sometimes the mainstream economics is completely right and the Austrians are completely wrong. Uh, and then sometimes the Austrians have very important points, although my view in the end was they're not express they, they are expressing them in an idiosyncratic way, which makes it hard to express a reasonable point to a broader audience. So for example, like Austrian views on competition. You know, I would say rather than having this uh, Rothbardian view that monopoly is by definition impossible on the free market, say like you can say the same thing. <coughs> uh, you can <coughs> <clears throat> um, you can say the same thing in mainstream terms of saying that, you know, uh, first of all, like you know, in a world with fixed costs, perfect competition is not actually optimal, and the important welfare-reducing kinds of monopoly are actually the ones caused by government, not the kinds that you see in markets. So, so you know, like you know, like the Austrian points that are good are ones where you could express them in the language of mainstream economics and thereby have a lot more influence. You know, there are many mainstream economists who criticize antitrust policy, for example, often using arguments that are a lot like the ones that Austrians use, but they're speaking the mainstream language, and so the arguments are much more influential, whereas Austrians say, well, even when they have a valid point, they often want to go and phrase it using their non-standard terminology, right? And, you know, I'd say there's no one right way to define a word, but... 
there are confusing ways of defining words. So like when almost everyone else on earth says that inflation is the rate of change of the price level, and Austrians say that inflation is an increase in the money supply, this to me is a case where, look, I understand there, both definitions are okay, but one definition is much more popular and it's super confusing when you use your, uh, when you have your own definition that hardly anyone uses and everyone else has a different definition, right? So, you know, my overall view on Austri Austrian economics is that it's, you know, you know, there are many good Austrian ideas, but unfortunately, uh, by the intellectual strategy that Austrians have used, they mostly kept their best ideas in a ghetto. Right, and so I believe in not living in an intellectual ghetto. I believe in selling, marketing, right, or you know, merchandising, merchandising. Like what? Are the, like you know, it's not a, not enough to have a good idea. You've got to sell it. You've got to find people that don't currently buy your product and convince them that it's a good product and that they should start using it. Right. So that's you know, what what I've always tried to do with my books. Always try to appeal to someone that does not already agree with you. Right, and never make them change the way they use words before you can have a conversation. Right, like I've had people say, like you shouldn't have called your book the case against education that you should have called it the case against schooling, and I say, look, almost everyone uses the word schooling and education interchangeably. I don't want to have to convince people to use words differently before we can even start the conversation. I just want to use words in the normal, conventional way, and then tell people something that surprises them and interests them and sounds like it might be true. So the answers are very consistent with my book, The Case Against Education. In that book, I say that the main benefit of school is getting a stamp on your forehead. You know, una estampa, una estampa, right? That's, what, that's the main purpose of education. I mean, if you wanna learn, you don't have to go to school, just read, read books, talk to people. You can learn all you want. Right, that's the way I've learned almost everything I know. It's not by sitting in a class, listening to someone boring me to death. No, the way it's by reading and by writing, right? And by talking to people, right? So the reason I went to UC Berkeley is that it is the number one school in the, uh, number one uh, public school in the state of California. It's the second best school and, and it is the best cheap school in California. So that's the reason why I went there. I would say that for economics, Berkeley is not very left-wing, actually. Berkeley is a very main, is, you know, it's very mainstream. And you know, like Berkeley, you know, like, it's important, you know, like whenever you think about UC Berkeley, it's important to remember there's a very big difference between the city of Berkeley and the school. The city of Berkeley is very left-wing. You know, there are Maoist cults and, and like for real, right? However, the faculty, I would say, is actually very normal for whatever the discipline is. So it's a very left-wing discipline like anthropology, then Berkeley professors will be very left-wing, but not because they're in Berkeley, because their field is left-wing. Economics, on the other hand, is a much more moderate field, and the, P and the professors at Berkeley are therefore moderate. Um, and so why I went to Princeton, then it's even clearer. Princeton was the only top five school that offered me money to go there. All right, so, um, you know, taught you also, like for professors, uh, prestigious schools are very important. I applied to all the top schools except for Chicago. And I got into uh, Yale with uh, free tuition, but no money to live on. And I got into Princeton with free tuition and money to live on. And so Princeton was my best deal, right? And uh, so that's, well, that's honestly the reason why I went there was that uh, like it was the best signal for the lowest price. Of course, anything that I like is totally different, right? <laughs> my, my negative conclusions only apply to the two normal things. Uh, so that's you know, the, you know, the joke answer. Uh, the real answer is it's complicated. So like, you know, when I teach, I, do, I try to actually teach the students as much as I can and to improve their minds and to pour knowledge into them. I also have the very sad fact that when I grade final exams, I see that I usually fail. I can try my very best, and still most students do not understand the material. How can this be if, I, uh, if I'm doing a good job? Well, one possibility is I'm not doing a good job, right? I have that, that weighs on me. Maybe I'm not doing a good job. Another possibility is the students are not working very hard. This is one where every school I go to, I have to say there's a lot of evidence the students are not working very hard. Right now, you could say it's your fault for failing to motivate them. 
All right, maybe, but there's a lot of people who would not like labor economics no matter who taught it. You know, I could be a supermodel, and <laughs> still they wouldn't learn labor economics from me. Uh, so now what's going on, you know, you know so that, that's especially with undergraduates, so, you know, graduate students at George Mason are much more motivated, and so I see I have a much greater ability to teach them because you need to have two things for learning. You know, you need to have a teacher that, that, that has something to teach, but a student that actually wants to learn. So that's what uh, is going on like to a greater degree, right? And that's, you know, I was at um, you know, Marquine, you know, 20 years ago, I've been here. Uh, so, you know, like it depends upon whether the students are motivated as well as whether the faculty are doing a good job. Uh, you know, uh, but, you know, like in, at, you know, at the end, like it's always disappointing being an educator. Like even if conditions are very favorable, still like the feeling that like, why can't things be better? It does weigh on me. Uh, there is one school that I have you know, great confidence in, and this is my home school. So I do educate personally my, my two oldest sons. And here, right, I feel like I've got you know, a very good system pedagogy, but I've also have extremely motivated students. Uh, but I also have a lot more time. You know, so with my regular students, we have you know, 45 hours total. That's, that is a class, you know, five, you know, so three hours a week for 15 weeks. That's the way, that's our system. Uh, with, well, with my, own, with my own sons, we can be working on something for 45 hours every week. Not 45 hours once, 45 hours every week. Right? So, and, I, you know, I, so when I am, have absolute power over the system, right, and I control every part of it, then I see that I can get very good results. Although, of course, I didn't get a random assignment of students. I got my kids. So if you just gave me some random students, so what could I do with them? I'm confident that I could do, my, I could do far better than, than normal, right? So, you know, I don't even speak Spanish, but I've still been able to get my, to teach my sons to speak excellent Spanish because though I don't speak it myself, I know how it should be taught, right? I have read the research and observed the, uh, the effective methods and the ineffective methods. So I know that, you know, the inmersion method is the only true method. It is the one true method for teaching language, right? So, you know, hardly any schools in America use it. And that's why hardly any Americans learn a foreign language in school. But it's something where when you give me complete control, I can go and hire a tutor. And I say, look, I don't want any English in this class. Zero. Just don't do it. Right, like I'm the boss. This is this, this is my system. Do my system. Right, so you know when I when I have that kind of control, I feel I can get very good results. But it is so far from a from a normal teaching experience. It's one you know if you say like these students are your complete responsibility for four years, improve them as much as you can. Then I would say okay, now I'm really going to work on this because I can do so much. But when I only have a students for 45 hours, if they, assuming they show up, which a lot of students in America do not, you know, then you know, my honest answer is it's fairly disappointing, right? And you know, like the number of times that students don't even understand things like, you know, you know, you know like, like, you know, like, let me do this way. I've given a whole lecture, a whole lecture on the minimum wage, and then I give a test on it. And I, and I look at the, read the students' answers, and wow, a lot of the students don't even understand that I was negative about the minimum wage. They didn't understand that I was critical in some way, right? Never mind, they didn't understand the arguments. They can't draw the supply and demand diagrams. They didn't understand that I was hostile. And it's so depressing, right? I remember when I first taught this, I was thinking, wow, maybe I'm you know, being heavy handed and this is just you know, indoctrination. And then I see the results and say, no, I was not nearly heavy handed enough. I need to repeat and repeat and tell them over and over so they get the point, right? And that's really what you have to do if you want to have any help. It's, it's unfortunate, but yeah, that's the world. What I learned the most about Spain is I think this country has more potential for improvement than almost any other country I know because you have many hundreds of millions of fluent Spanish speakers who would be happy to come here immediately if they could just get a job. So there is so much human talent that is ready to move to Spain. I'm a big fan of immigration, but for the United States, there aren't that many English speakers who want to move to the United States. 
right? For Spain, there are so many Spanish speakers who would love to move to Spain, would have a great life here, and would contribute so much to the productivity of the society and the enrichment of the society. I had a, a Pakistani Uber driver who told me, España es como una madre. <laughs> right? He was so happy to be here. He said he loved it here. And he was saying, like in Pakistan, you know, like he say like, like he, you know, he, he has no comida. He didn't, you know, he was hungry in, say, you know, in Pakistan. He was starving. And he did everything he could to get here. And now he, you know, he, like, he speaks great Spanish. Well, you can, my son, you know, good enough Spanish, right? And, you know, he is a productive member of Spanish society, right? You say he's just an Uber driver. Like, what's wrong with Uber drivers? I love Uber drivers. They're great people. They do something very useful for, uh, for mankind. Why is it that you wouldn't want to have you know, millions more, millions more people like him? Someone who comes here and appreciates the great life that he's able to have here and contributes and is productive. So we just see you know, hundreds of millions of people that are ready to move here you know, today if only they can get a green light, if only people can, can look at other human beings as an opportunity instead of as a burden. If you, if you can have policies where you say, look, you're, you, know, you, you have to wait three years for benefits, but work can start today. If you could have that mentality, there is so much that can be done. You know, and when I took a train uh, to Barcelona, so they, you know, Spain is actually much more like the United States than other European countries I've been to because your land is so empty. So empty. Well, you know, like in the United States, you can drive for hours. Like, where are the people here? Right? And Spain, it's the same way. I couldn't believe it. It's like every other European country. You know, like there's, it's, it's much higher population density. Spain, just to see the places where there's no people and to realize that there are hundreds of millions of people who would love to be here. And like, where would they live? We'll build new cities. The Spain should build new cities, deregulate housing. The, you know, the, you know, they're doing it in China. They're doing it in India. They're building new cities. Why can't Spain build new cities too? Why is the, this not the great land of opportunity? Why is Spain not the country that everyone on earth is talking about as you know, revolutionizing the world economy, like the, the fastest growing economy, one where people see it as a beacon of opportunity? There's no reason Spain should not be a great beacon why you couldn't have a Spanish Statue of Liberty here in Madrid, 500 feet high with the flame, say you know, like this is where like we open up our doors to the you know to mankind because we believe that human beings are the ultimate resource. How do you say the ultimate resource in Spanish? Like and, and it's only the you know, only barrier between this fantastic new world and the world of Spain today, it's not technology. We have the technology it's the it's the the mentality. It's the mentality. You know, it's a zero sum mentality, a nationalist mentality, a socialist mentality. So, you know, these are the ideas that have impoverished the world, that have stopped people from realizing great opportunities. And it's the ideas of places like Juan de Mariana. These are the ideas that are the hope of mankind. And Spain is a country where the opportunity for uh, for, uh, for greatness is so is so strong. And so I say, like, just open your eyes and look at Spain. It's uh, like, it's a nice country. You know, like, you know, España es como una madre, but it could be the mother of so much more. And why not? Why settle for this when there's so much more that could be done?